So um, the index of refraction is a number that is related to the speed of light in a certain medium. And index of refraction uh, can be calculated by taking the speed of light in a vacuum, that's this, divided by the speed in that material. So this number is 3 times 10 to the 8, and this is in a medium. So glass would have its own index of refraction, water, um, plastic, anything that's transparent would have oil, would have you know an index of refraction, and those are found in your book on page 732. Okay, the other equations that we can have is when you go from one medium to another, um, the frequency does not change, but the wavelength does. So if we were to go from one medium to another, we would have the wavelength in the vacuum over the wavelength in the new medium. So another way to find index of refraction is the wavelength in, um, excuse me, in a vacuum divided by the wavelength in a certain medium. The last equation we're going to be considering is um, n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2. Now what this is, is let's say we have air, for example, and water. And let's say we have a ray of light that comes and when it hits the water, actually part of it, the ray kind of splits actually, and part of it bounces off and reflects off, and so it would follow the law of reflection. But we're not going to worry about that one right now. We're going to worry about the part that goes into the water. And it would bend. So light bends as it travels from one medium into another, as long as it hits the border at an angle. Okay, so we would call this the incident ray. We call this the refracted ray. This would be the angle of incidence, and this would be the angle of refraction. Now sometimes it's easier just to call this theta 1 and this theta 2, and then the index of refraction in air is, would be theta 1 and the index of refraction out here would be theta 2, and you just pop them into here. So I'm going to do a couple of examples that I didn't have time to do in class, and they are going to be found on page 733, and they'll be using these equations, so I'm going to erase them. And we'll start with the first example there. Okay, so uh, bottom of page 733, angle of refraction for glass. Okay, it says a light ray of wavelength 598 or 589 nanometers. A nano is times is times 10 to the minus 9, and visible light is uh, on the order of nanometers of their wavelength. Okay, it's traveling through air and incident on a smooth, flat slab of crown glass. So it's coming from air and going into crown glass, okay? And it is incident at an angle of 30 degrees to the normal. Now, when they say 30 degrees, they mean this angle. You would think they'd use this angle, but it, it's sort of weird. Snell's law does not use this angle, it uses this one. So this is 30 degrees, and it's gonna bend. Okay, and the question is, find the angle of refraction. So that would be this one. Um, so I'm going to call this 1 and call this 2. And if you look on the page before on the table, you'll see that the index of refraction for air, and I'm going to call that 1. I'll call this theta 1. It's 1.000, then 297 or something like that. So we're going to round it off and call it 1.003. That's so close to being 1. And that what that tells us is that the speed of light in air is pretty much the same as the speed of light in vacuum. It's just slightly slower. Um, crown glass, though, if you look that up, it is 1.52. So that's pretty significant. It, light would go significantly slower in crown glass. 
So anyway, so I want I will plug this into Snell's law, which is um, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. Um, these are the ones, so 1.0003 sine theta, um, excuse me, sine of 30 equals 1.52 sine theta 2, and theta 2 turns out to be 19.2 degrees. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Um, plug it into the equation. What you really need to get down is, you know, what the theta 1 is and theta 2 and to be able to draw the picture. You kind of need to be able to draw the picture on these. Okay? And know that the angle they're talking about is this one, not this one. Okay, so now if you flip the page, we'll go to the next problem, the next sample problem. I believe the next one is also the same wavelength. Yeah, it says light of wavelength 589 in a vacuum. Okay, so this is in a vacuum, so I'm going to call that, put the little zero here, okay, because that little zero was in a vacuum. Passes through a piece of fused quartz with an index of refraction of 1.48. So I've kind of got a, a vacuum and fused quartz, which has an index of refraction of 1.48. Um, the index of refraction of vacuum would be 1 because n is equal to c over v. So if these are both the same number, you know, if you're in a vacuum, then n would be 1. Okay. Um, it says find the speed of light in fused quartz. So that's the equation we'd want to use. If you use quartz, 1.458 is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 over V. So V is 2.06. And that is 2.06. Uh, notice that we didn't need the drawing. This, you know, you draw that for Snell's Law. I mean, uh, it's a good idea to just start the drawing and maybe you don't need it. Okay, part B asks for what is the wavelength of this light infused quartz. So this is part A, here's part B. Um, wavelength, we have this equation. So 1.458 is equal to 589 over that. And that turns out to be 404 nanometers. Okay, so um, notice that I didn't change the units here. Oh, n, by the way, doesn't have units. You know, this would be meters per second over meters per second, so the units cancel. This is nanometers over nanometers, so the units cancel. I didn't have to actually multiply by 10 to the minus 9. I just kept this in nanos, and then my answer ended up in nanos. Okay, part C um, asks, what is the frequency of light-infused quartz? Okay, so they want the frequency in the quartz. And so it would make sense to use this equation from way back when. Okay, the velocity infused quartz, wavelength infused quartz, frequency infused quartz. And if you look in the book, they don't do that. They use the frequency in a vacuum, wavelength in a vacuum, and frequency in a vacuum, even though you were asked for the frequency infused quartz. The reason why is because when you go from one medium to another, frequency doesn't change. So the frequency in fused quartz will be the same as the frequency in a vacuum. So they just found the frequency in a vacuum and recognized that it would be the same. But um, I want to find it this way. Okay, so this number here is going to be this, and I'm not going to put this number. I'm going to put this one. Okay, so 3 times 10 to the 8 over 1.458 equals this number, um, that would be this, I didn't put the n in, put that in there. Um, I'm not going to put 404, I'm going to put this, I'm doing that for a reason. You can probably figure out what the reason is as you look. Um, you know, I'm going to put the times 10 to the minus 9 because see, here, um, you know, I had just nanometers over nanometers, so it didn't matter, but here it's going to matter because I've got, like, this is, you know, 
this is in meters per second, so I can't have nanometers over here when I've got meters over here. Anyways, I'm going to find frequency. I hope that you can see that these are going to cancel. And what we have here is, oh, that's just the speed of light in a vacuum and the wavelength in a vacuum. And there we go. So it worked. Anyways, the answer here is on, there's 5.09 times 10 to the 14. Okay, and then I wanted to give you a couple of hints about the homework problems. There was problem number eight um, on the homework problem. And as you read it, you might be wondering what is going on with that. So, so problem number eight on the homework, it says, um, light is incident normal to a one centimeter layer of water that lies on top of a flat lucite plate. So here's my lucite plate and here's my water, okay? Light is incident on a one centimeter thick layer. So this is one centimeter that lies on a top uh, plate of lucite that is 0.5 centimeters. Okay, so I didn't draw it to scale, but you got the idea. Um, how much more time is required for light to pass through this than to pass through air? Okay. So what you need to do is you need to figure out the time it takes, you know, the time in air and the time here, and then subtract them. Okay, so we're trying to figure out how much longer it takes when you go through here. So how do you do that? Well, here's some equations that you can use. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. But first of all, you need to figure out the speed of light in this one and in this one. And to do that, you're going to use n is equal to c over v. And then we can't forget that velocity is distance over time. Light doesn't speed up or slow down. So we don't have to worry about acceleration. So when we knock out acceleration out of our kinematic equations, we get this. So those are my hints for number eight. Uh, I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Um, the other one I wanted to look at was number 13, because it asks you kind of a weird question. And so I wanted to explain what that question is. So here's number 13. 13 says, a ray of light is incident on a block of clear ice. Okay, if they don't tell you what it started in, assume it was air. Okay, like this one, they didn't say what it came from. Okay, and it's incident at an angle of 40 degrees to the normal. So this one is the 40. You might wonder how I knew it was this one and not this one. Well, let me read that. A ray of light is incident on the surface of a block at an angle of 40 degrees. So let's knock out a few words. A ray of light is incident at 40 degrees. So that's going to be this one. Um, anyways, part of the light is reflected and part is refracted. Find the angle between the reflected and the refracted light. So here's the refracted light. The reflected light is going to go up like this. It's going to obey the law of reflection, which makes this 50 degrees. So you need to figure out what this angle is, and then this angle, and then we're trying to figure out this is what you want. I'll put it in black. This is what you're actually asked for, is that angle between the two blacks. 